Mr. President. The Senator from Tennessee is right. I ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without objection. And I ask consent to speak as a morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, um, last week, uh, the Senator from Wyoming, Senator Enzi, and the Senator from Illinois, the Democratic Whip, introduced a piece of legislation which is called the Marketplace Fairness Act. And in doing so, I think they've solved a problem that has persisted <laughs> at, in almost every state in the Union and that Congress has had a difficult time dealing with for the last 14 or 15 years. And that is the problem of what do we do about state sales taxes, um, which everybody owes every time they make a purchase. I mean, if you buy a television set uh, at the local appliance store, you owe New Mexico sales tax or Tennessee sales tax. And if you buy it from Amazon, and you live in New Mexico or Tennessee, you owe the sales tax. The difference has been that the local retailer is required to collect it and does and sends it to the state, but the online vendor, let's say Amazon, is not required to collect it, and so it doesn't. And so most individuals, like if I, I bought a television set from Amazon earlier this year, well, I. I would need to, at the end of the year, file a form with our state government and say, I bought it, they didn't collect the sales tax, so I owe the sales tax. But the truth is, most Americans don't do that. And that's a $23 billion a year tax avoidance, a great big tax loophole. And one may ask, well, why has that, not, that loophole not been closed? We hear a lot of talk about loopholes around here. And we know uh, states would like to have dollars uh, right now, either to lower taxes or pay for services. And most of us think that we shouldn't prefer one business over another business or one taxpayer over another taxpayer. And, and the problem is that this, the Supreme Court 20 years ago said that the technology didn't exist 20 years ago to make it easy for online vendors to collect the sales tax in the same way the local shoe store or local vendor collects it. And so it would be an undue burden on interstate commerce. So for 20 years, there's been this great big loophole. Now, here, here's the loophole in practical terms. I called the owner of the Nashville Boot Company uh, last week after we introduced the bill, Frank Har Harwell. And at the beginning, he sold everything. He sold cowboy boots online. I think it's the Nashville Cowboy Boot Company. But he sold boots online. And he said he sold as much as $400,000 a year of cowboy boots online. That was his major business. But then he said, he began, he was about the only one doing that. And I assume if you want a cowboy boot, you'd, Nashville would sound like a good place to buy them. So he was doing all right. Now he said there are about 200 people selling boots online. So he does most of his boot selling out of his store. He has a store there in Bellmead Plaza, right next to where I take my granddaughter to breakfast on Saturday mornings. But this is what he says happens to him. He says people come into the Nashville Cowboy Boot Store and they try on the cowboy boots and then they go home and buy it online because they don't have to pay the sales tax. Now they owe the sales tax, but as I said, the online sellers is not required to collect it and many taxpayers just fail to pay it even though they owe it. Now, we're not talking about internet tax here. The Senate had a great big debate on the internet access tax a few years ago. I was right in the middle of that. And by the time we got through with it, we had a compromise and we put a moratorium on internet access tax. So there's no such thing right now as an internet tax. We're not talking about an internet tax. We're not talking about a new tax. We're talking about the, the plain old state sales tax that Everybody except in five states, one of them being New Hampshire, uh, which doesn't have a sales tax, and 95 sta in, in, in 45 states, that is owed. Now, I've been very pleased with the reception that I've heard to the bill by Senator Enzi and Senator Durbin. It has five Republican co-sponsors. I'm one of them. It has five Democratic co-sponsors. We hope there will be more. Many of the people who saw problems with earlier attempts to fix the bill, 
believe this legislation solves the problem. Some of the early bills were, were large. This bill is 10 pages. It's very simple. If the problem was it was too complicated for Amazon to collect the online tax, they fix that because they've said, well, Tennessee, if it wants to require Amazon to do the same thing the local boot company does, it has to provide Amazon with software that'll make it simple for Amazon to collect the tax. When I want to know the weather in my hometown in outside Maryville, Tennessee, I simply put in weather and the zip code 37886, back comes the information. That's all an online vendor will have to do now. It'll just put in uh, Lamar Alexander, um, cowboy boots, whatever they cost, the zip code, and the computer software will figure out the local sales tax and report it to the vendor, and the vendor, once a quarter, will send the money electronically to whatever state. So the old problems don't exist. You don't have to sort out many different taxing districts. There has to be one rate for each state, up to the state to figure it out, up to the state to figure out the software. There can only be one state audit. It's, it's as easy as looking up the weather on Google or, or whatever other search engine you use. That'll be how easy it is. And the only reason why the Supreme Court said the states couldn't require online vendors to do the same thing that local vendors do was because of the burden on interstate commerce. Now, I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal today, which I thought was very well balanced. It takes a whole page. Should states require online retailers to collect sales tax? Yes, it's fair. No, protect small firms. Now, I'm not going to put this in the record, but uh, I, I do want to take issue with one, one argument in among those who said no protect small firms. Two, two arguments, really. One, the NC Durban legislation has a $500,000 exemption. So my friend in Nashville, who was the only, and I guess for a while, the leading seller of cowboy boots online, never made more than $400,000 in revenues. He said, I could tell that. So if he doesn't have more than $500,000 in revenue, he's not even affected by this legislation gives states the option to decide what to do. Second, this says that the legislation would overturn the Supreme Court ruling of 20 years ago. That's not accurate. It doesn't overturn anything. What the Supreme Court said 20 years ago was that at the state of technology that existed with lack of, with so many different taxing jurisdictions, it was an undue burden on interstate commerce for states to require online sellers to collect the tax that's owed. But this is what the court said, quote, this aspect of our decision is made easier by the fact that the underlying issue is not only one that Congress may be better qualified to resolve, but also one that Congress has the ultimate power to resolve. No matter how we evaluate the burdens that use taxes impose on interstate commerce, Congress remains free to disagree with our conclusions. And then it said, accordingly, Congress is now free to decide whether when and to what extent the states may burden interstate mail order concerns with a duty to collect use taxes. So this isn't overturning anything. It's simply saying, it's simply responding to the invitation by the Supreme Court 20 years ago that said, as we look at it, this is too big a burden. That was back when there were thousands of taxing districts and no easy way to collect the money. But it did say that Congress had the right to decide what represents a burden. And what this bill says is there are two ways that states may do this. There's the Streamlining Act that about half the states have joined together and said, we'll, we'll create a single way to allow online vendors to operate. Or the state of Kentucky may say, we don't like what they're doing. We'll create our own way. And as long as it's a single way, a single rate, a single audit, and the state provides a software, the vendor can, can do it. That is why Amazon decided last week that it supported the NZ Durban bill. It's been probably the leading opponent of the bill. And on the Republican or conservative side, there have been a lot of people who said, way, we're, this, this is about taxes. Well, it's about taxes, but it's about taxes in a way that conservatives like to talk about. We like to say we don't like it when the government policy prefers 
some taxpayers over others, some uh, businesses over others. We also, on this side of the aisle, really believe in states' rights. And this bill doesn't decide anything. It simply empowers states to make their own decisions about taxes. And in our state, for example, we have one of the lowest tax burdens, but we have the highest state sales tax. If we're able to collect three, four, five hundred million more dollars in Tennessee from this tax that's now avoided because of the loophole, I'm sure there'll be proposals to reduce the sales tax rate or to reduce some other tax. And certainly the money will help to avoid the arrival of a state income tax, which is about the most hated word in our tax vocabulary in Tennessee. So I'd like to introduce into the congressional record some of the some of the responses that have come uh, just since last week. Uh, the Memphis Commercial Appeal editorial, which uh, uh, urged that Congress close this longstanding loophole in the current tax law, it's the right thing to do. And Greg Johnson, a conservative columnist in the Knoxville News Sentinel said, online sales tax bill would level the playing field. His article, refers to the fact that 10 years ago, William F. Buckley Jr., he, whom, whom he calls the father of modern conservatism, opined to the National Review about this problem and, and that it needed a result. The same sort of argument was made by Al Cardenas, who's head of the American Conservative Union, who wrote an article last week and said, uh, this needs to be fixed and supports a bill like the one we introduced. And an editorial from the Seattle Times and an editorial from the Paris, Tennessee Post-Intelligencer an editorial from the Denver Post, and one from, uh, uh, from Bellevue in Illinois. All of these make the same points. This is a state's rights argument. It is about allowing states to close a loophole, a tax loophole. It is about stopping the subsidization of some taxpayers, of other taxpayers, stopping the subsidization of some business over others. About the only ones left who are complaining are the taxpayers and the businesses who enjoy being subsidized by other taxpayers and other businesses, and that, in our opinion, isn't the correct tax policy. I'm very pleased with the work of Senator Enzi, Senator Durbin, and I'll conclude where I started. I think they have solved the problem. And as more senators look at the fairness of the Marketplace Fairness Act and look at the options it gives each state, I hope we have more co-sponsors, and if I were running an online retailer in this country, uh, I would begin to make my plans to collect the sales taxes that are already owed and return them to the states from which they're collected because it's the law and states will have the right under this to do it and more and more online vendors are making voluntary agreements with state to collect these taxes that are already owed. I thank the president and I yield the floor.